Greetings once again, Python coders. This is, as always, Alan D. Moore, the author of that veritable codex of PyCute wisdom, Mastering GUI Programming with Python, available from the publisher Pact Publications, from Amazon or wherever fine books on Python GUI programming are sold. In today's video, we're going to look at a problem that a lot of us run into as we're starting to get into GUIs. And that is the problem of creating GUI for a long-running process without having that GUI lock up. We're going to look at a couple ways to address this problem. So today I've written a little program um, and it is a file hasher. So it takes a path and I've written this little function here and what it does is it goes through all the files that are under that path and all the subdirectories and the sub subdirectories and everything and it gets the the SHA1 hash of that file and it will yield up a, a string of the path name and what the hash is so I don't want to go into detail in this function uh, this is actually what we call a generator function because I'm using the yield keyword and that might be a little over your head if you're if you're new to Python essentially what this is is it's a special function it's going to return a generator and a generator is like an iterable but it only calculates the next item on the list one at a time so as you iterate through this generator it's only going to do enough work to to get the next item on the list in real time uh, and that's important because um, whereas a function that would just return a list or something would have to do all that work up front and then return a big list which you would then iterate through a generator is is only going to uh, need to do a small amount of work every time we iterate over it okay but I'm not going to dig into that that's that's kind of beside the point the real point is that this is a process, this function is a process that is long running, okay? Depending on what directory you give it, if you give it one of your top level directories maybe, it could take minutes, even hours to run on your computer. And it's also a process that can give you regular feedback if you program it right, okay? So down here, I've got a main window. And in my main window, I've created a form. Uh, that form has a line edit where I can type in a file root, so like a, whatever path I want to uh, dig into. Uh, I've got a go button, and uh, I've got a table widget for the results. And I've configured that table widget here on these lines, um, just kind of setting it to stretch, setting it to expand, setting some headers. Uh, and then everything's laid out in a form layout, and that's pretty much my GUI. Now I've connected the return pressed signal in the in the uh, line edit, as well as the click signal on the button to this method called self dot start hashing. And what that looks like is down here, start hashing. Uh, it starts out by clearing the table. It then gets the file root out of the text of the line edit and checks to make sure it exists. And if it doesn't, we get a little error. Then I create my generator. Okay, I, I call recursive hashes, give it that file root that we entered. Um, and then I, that gives me my generator, which I can iterate here. And I'm just going to iterate that with a for loop, getting the name and the SHA1 sum for each file and then we call this add hash to table that looks like this so it just uh, adds a new row to the to table widget and then it sets the first column to the name second column to the uh, checksum and then just so that we can check up on this on the command line I'm also printing those values since I've made this a generator my expectation is that as I loop through this, okay, every time I'm adding a row to the table. So as my utility hashes each file, I expect to see that row appearing in my table widget. Well, let's go ahead and run this. Okay. 
There it is. There's my GUI. Uh, we're going to give it a fairly short directory. I'm going to give it my boot directory. And I'm on Linux here, so if you're not familiar with Linux, this is where my kernel lives. It's a fairly underpopulated directory. I hit start hashing, and you'll notice these things pop up. Okay, but you'll notice they didn't pop up. If you were watching quickly enough, you'll notice that here at the command line, we saw a lot of output, and this didn't show up until the end. And that becomes more evident if I do a bigger directory. I'm going to do slash user. Now, notice my GUI is locked up. So down here at the command line, this is definitely doing something. You can see it's spitting out. Uh, hashes the files that it's doing but this didn't clear out the table uh, my button appears to be stuck and in fact I'm going to minimize this and then maximize it again you you can see my window is totally locked up I'm it's just like this is like Windows 98 right you know when you paint the window all over the screen yeah it, it's totally locked up so let's go down here we're going to cancel this Okay, what can we do to fix this? Well, let's first understand why is this happening? Why does this do this? Now, it seems like I'm adding the hash to the table every time that I pull something from the generator. And it is printing, so we know it's not like it's waiting to call this function until it's done all the work, right? Because I am using a generator. So why is it not showing up? It comes down here to this app.exec. This is the event loop of the application. And so what happens in the event loop is the program is pulling things off of what we call the event queue. And the event queue is key here. So if you're from the UK, you probably know exactly what a queue is because you have waited in one at the bus terminal, you've waited in one at the cinema, you've probably waited in one at the tea house, and maybe even for the loo. If you're an American like me, we call that a line, right? But in programming, we use the word queue, and it, it means a line where the first thing in the line gets taken off first and dealt with. Uh, kind of like the checkout aisle in the grocery store. So at the grocery checkout, people come and they line up, and one by one they bring their carts, and um, they get checked out by the cashier. So I don't know if this has ever happened to you. Let me let me just uh, take a little tangent here. This happens to me every now and then. So I'm on the way home from work, and I stop at the grocery store. I'm just going to pick up two or three items, you know, loaf of bread, jug of milk, three pounds of bacon, uh, just basic essentials. I get in line, and just as I'm coming up to the checkout lane, in comes this guy, and he's got, you know three or four friends with him, and he's got like five carts of food, right? Just loaded to the top with all kinds of food. Just zips in there right before me with his five carts and starts checking out. And of course, you know, it's just taking forever to get all this stuff on the conveyor belt and scanned and bagged. And, you know, he's sending somebody back to swap something out because it got smashed or whatever. And it's taking forever. So finally they get all the food, you know, run through the scanner. And then this guy pulls out like a dossier full of coupons, you know. So then he's getting all those scanned and, you know, arguing about, well, this should be 25 cents off every can of biscuits, not just the first can of biscuits, you know, whatever. They get all that sorted out, and then, of course, it's time to pay, and the guy doesn't have cash, and he doesn't have a credit card. He's, you know, paying by, like, personal check or maybe some kind of title deed from the 1800s or, you know, like, bartering chickens or something, and they have to get a manager and a couple lawyers and a trade negotiator from the U.N., and, you know, like, just a huge mess. And by that time, of course, there's like 20 people in line behind you. And all of you are waiting there with, like, two items and exact change in cash in your hands, ready to plop down. But you're stuck there because Mr. Five Carts, you know, is, is dealing with his stuff. And finally, he deals with his stuff. And then you get to finally put down your money and quickly run through the line, right? Well, that situation is an exact parallel for what is happening in our program. So 
PyQt has this thing called an event queue. And every cycle of the event loop, it runs through that event queue in order, in the order that things arrived, and it just processes them, it deals with them. So you have events, and events are like your, uh, your customers, okay? So an event would be something like a button click, right? I click a button in the GUI, that's an event, it goes in the event queue. And when the loop pulls that thing off the event queue, it says, okay, well, what's attached to this event, right? So what, it's like, what's in the customer's cart? Well, what's attached to that event is a function callback. So it calls that function and it deals with that. It's just like it's scanning everything in the cart. You know, it's dealing with that function. Okay, so in, in this case, let's scroll back up here. We have right here, this event, this clicked event, and it's connected to this function, start hashing. So when that event gets processed from the queue, it calls start hashing. But until start hashing returns, until we are done with this function, all the rest of the things in that event queue have to wait. Okay, so why does that lock up the GUI? Okay, when we call add hash to table, right, it adds this row into this table, and from the background sense, that table has that new row. But once it's got that new row, it emits a signal to repaint itself. It says, hey, Q application, right, I, I need to be repainted. So it doesn't do that right away, it puts that on the event queue. Likewise, any other things I do, moving the window, resizing the window, if I minimize it and bring it back up, it needs to be repainted. So all of those events that would trigger a redraw or some other action, they're on the event queue. And those events are like me and the 20 other people at the grocery line who are sitting there. It won't take long to deal with us, right? We're, we're simple, small, quick events, but because Mr. Five Carts is up there getting checked out, we all have to wait. And that's exactly what's happening in this program. So the question then becomes, what can we do? So one thing that people try, let's think of it through the grocery store. What if we made Mr. Five Carts step aside and let's go ahead and deal with all those other people in line and then we'll deal with Mr. Five Carts. So what they'll do then is they'll maybe put this for loop in its own function and they'll delay that function. Okay, and I, actually we can try this. Let's go ahead and do this. So let's make this a function. We'll say, uh, we'll just call it hash processing loop, pass in self. So then we'll need to make this self.hashgen and we can say self.hashgen. Now we'll delay this. We're gonna use something called a queue timer, which is what it sounds like. It's a, it's a timer. It's like a little uh, kitchen timer. You set it to a time, it goes off, and when it goes off, it can trigger something. And it has this class method called single shot, which does exactly that. So let's set it to 500 milliseconds, self.hash processing loop, okay? So now what we're doing is we're, we're gonna delay this processing for half a second, okay? And let's try that. All right, let's try user again, start hashing. So now you can see the button isn't like awkwardly stuck down, okay? So that did well, but my GUI is still otherwise, it's, it's unresponsive. So didn't really help us in that regard, okay? But at least the button had time to kind of redraw itself. So that's an improvement. So that didn't work out. And you know, you can kind of imagine using our grocery store analogy, why that didn't work out. If you just think about, if you put Mr. Five Carts aside, eventually you're still gonna have to deal with him. And when you do, people are gonna line up, right? Events are gonna pile up in that queue, no matter when you deal with it. So we're gonna have to get more creative. 
So let's say our kindly cashier puts her foot down and says, I'm sorry, Mr. Five Carts. I'm not going to process all your five carts at once. I'm going to say you can process one cart at a time. So you can come through the line, in my, my checkout line, with one cart. Then you have to take your next cart to the very back of the line. Okay? And you can process that cart. And then you have to take your third cart to the very back of the line. And you have to keep doing this until we're all done. So I've implemented that over here. All right? This is the same recursive hashes function, the same form, same main window. We have the same add hash to table function, or method, sorry. Uh, we have the same, almost the same start hashing function at first. So it clears the table, get the file root, you know, check to make sure it exists. We get our generator, but now we've got this method, next hash. Okay, so instead of a for loop, I've got a queue timer single shot with a delay of nothing. So right away, it calls this next hash function. Now, why did I use a single shot with no delay? So a queue timer does not simply delay a callback. The queue timer waits a certain specified amount of time and then puts an event in the event queue that is connected to that callback. So this is simply a way for us to in immediately put an event in the event queue that's connected to this callback. So instead of blocking all the rest of the code right now and calling self.nextHash, we're just placing it on the event loop. Inside this function, we're going to try to get the next item from the generator. If you're not familiar with the next function, it's a function you can call on any iterator and it'll just get the next item off the list and kind of put the pointer up to the to the next item after that. So if you continually call next on an iterator, you'll continually get back the next item, the next item, the next item. And when it runs out, it's going to raise a stop iteration exception. So we're catching that here and we just return the function when that happens with no result. But if we do get a result from our generator, uh, we're going to add it to the table, and then we're going to call single shot again and put another call to next hash in the event queue. So essentially what we're doing is instead of iterating with a for loop, we're using the event queue itself as a loop to iterate our generator. And this is the equivalent to what I, what I described in the grocery line. We're going to make Mr. Five Carts go through the checkout lane one cart at a time and let all the other events, all the other customers, get processed through that line in between each one. Okay, let's run this one. Okay, so we'll try user and start the hashing. All right, this works well. Look at that. So we are getting constant output. I can scroll it without any lag. My GUI is responsive, and that's great. So that is working out very well. I'm going to stop it because we don't need to do all that work. However, that seemed to work well. But what happens if we try it on a directory with some really big files? So I'm going to point it at my virtual box directory in which I've got some files that are tens of gigabytes, you know, 50, 60, some gigabytes in size. What happens then? Okay, so it starts out well, but now it's locked up again. I'm clicking all over this GUI. It is totally unresponsive. And you notice in the output down here that we're not getting print output down here. And what that tells me is that it is processing one file. So before we were getting lots of output in the in the command line, but nothing in the GUI, which told us that, you know, all the work was being done, but it wasn't being reported back. Well, now the work is still processing. So until that completes, this is going to be frozen. So what does that mean? Why is that happening? 
Well, think about our grocery store analogy. So we're making this Mr. Five Carts, as we call him, go through the, the line one cart at a time. But his cart may still have a hundred items in it. And that's still going to take a long time to process, even if it's just one cart. So if we're breaking up our long process into chunks, every chunk is still going to block, and we're still going to be stuck waiting for that chunk to finish, and our GUI is going to be locked up while we're waiting. Because if we block the event queue, all those drawing commands, all those mouse clicks, all those drags, typing, any kind of event is going to be stuck and waiting on that one part of the process to finish. Okay, so what do we do? Well, let's think about our grocery store. What's the best thing that the store manager can do when we're in this situation with a guy with five carts of groceries? Well, he can do what store managers never do, and he should open up another grocery lane. That way, Mr. Five Carts can go off in this other lane, and they can take care of him over there, and we can keep the original lane open, and all of us with our two items and our exact change ready to go can fly right through the other lane and not have to wait. We can do the same thing in our code by using threads. Now this is going to get a little more complicated. I'm just going to warn you right now. But to start off, we still have our same recursive hashes function. I have not touched that. Still have our same main window, for the most part, as our layout's the same. We still have our add Oops, we still have our add hash to table right here. And we still mostly have our start hashing. We clear the table, get the file, and validate it. But then we've made some changes. So the first thing I did is I wrote this worker class. The worker class is based on QObject. It has a signal called hashed that sends out two strings. And it has a single method here, hash directory, that takes a string that's going to be the file root. And inside this method, we have basically our original for loop. So we create our generator from the root path. And then we iterate through it. And instead of putting these in the table this time, we're just emitting a signal. We're going to emit that hash signal with our path and our hash. Now in our main window, I've added this signal, hash requested, and it emits a string. And that string is going to be our uh, file system root that we put in. And you'll see how that works down here. So down here in our start hashing, I'm emitting that signal with the file root. Okay, so after we've determined the file root and validated it, I simply emit hash requested with the file root. Now, up here in our init function, after our layout code, we're going to create an instance of our worker object. Okay, we're just going to call it self.worker. Then we're going to create an instance of qthread. And that's going to be our worker thread. Now there's a few different ways you can use a Q thread. The way I'm showing you today is the recommended way. And it's not recommended by me, which I, I do recommend it, but not just me. This is what the community, what you know, people much smarter than me and much more versed in PyQt than I am will recommend that you do. Since our worker is based on Q object, it has this method move to thread. And we can pass that method an instance of QThread, and that will have the effect of taking that instance of this object, of our worker class, it will move it to a new thread. Okay? And it, it will execute it in a separate thread. Then we call start on the worker thread, which doesn't actually start it processing, it just kind of, it's like it turns on the thread. Okay? It's like we're, we're turning on the, uh, the light over this other checkout lane right here. We're starting it up. Okay. Finally, I connect some signals. So I've connected the hashed signal here to the add hash to table. So when the worker emits the hash, 
right? It's, it's going to emit those t that tuple of um, strings. That's connected directly to our add hash to table method that we've that we've had. Then I've connected our hash requested signal, which we emit whenever we submit our form to the workers hash directory method. All right. So the result of this will be when I submit the form, the file root that I entered will be sent via signal to our worker object and the worker object will start working its way through the generator and as it processes each file it will simply emit a signal. That signal will then come back to the main object and it will be added to the table. So let's try this out. So once again I'm going to give it my VM directory. And we're going to start hashing here. Okay, and you can see once again it stopped on that really big file. But even though it stopped in processing, my GUI is fully responsive. I can scroll that scroll bar, I can minimize it. Okay, bring it back up. You know, I can edit this text. Fully responsive. And this is ultimately, this is what we want, right? Even though this thing may take a while to process. Our GUI doesn't lock up. We don't have any of that awful Windows 98 kind of thing happening here. So that's awesome. I have made this look pretty painless, but there are some caveats that we need to talk about with threading. So first of all, one thing you have to do is you've got to put your, your working code, your, your big heavy lifting code in that object, or at least call it from your worker object. And you have to make sure that you only communicate with the worker using signals and slots. Okay, you cannot directly call methods on the worker. Let me show you what happens. So let's say instead of emitting this signal, I'm just going to directly call hash directory. Okay, let's see if that works. Let's do user here. And right away you can see, nope, that instantly broke it. Okay, we're, we're locked up again. Explaining why that happens is a little difficult. The way I like to think of it is anytime you are directly calling methods on that worker object, it's almost like you're pulling it back into the main thread. Or you're, you're anchoring it back into the main thread. You have to keep these two objects in different threads decoupled from one another by using the signals and slots. Okay, so you're going to have to think about your class design a little bit carefully to make sure that you can do that. If you've got things really tied together, if you've got things tightly coupled and GUI code tangled up with your processing code and back and forth, you're going to have a hard time. So you're really going to have to work on separation of concerns. Your, your algorithms for processing on the back end have got to be separate from your GUI code. They can't be tied together. You can't be, you know, trying to stick things in tables and read things from fields and all that in the middle of your working code. It's all got to be done with signals and slots. Okay, the other thing, if you are connecting these signals and slots just to Python callables and not to actual signals or in slots, I mean, so if you're not calling actual PyQt slots, um, you need to make sure that you connect your signals after you move the object into its own thread. If you connect your main thread to that object in the other thread before you've put it in the thread, um, it's, it's again, it's going to break the threading. You're going to be anchoring it back. Let me just demonstrate that for you real quick. Okay, so here's my, my slot connections. I'm going to go ahead and move these up here. So now I'm making my connections to the worker object before I move it to the thread. And one other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to comment this out. I'll tell you why in a second. So once again, let's try our threaded hasher user. So threading is broken. It's not, not doing the threading thing. For whatever reason, if you have to connect the slots before you move it to the thread, what you can also do 
is wrap your callback in this PyQt slot decorator. And I believe we talked about that in the signals and slots video. And that'll make it an actual Qt slot in C++ territory. And then you won't have this problem. So now if I run it, now you'll see our threading works again. Okay, the last thing I need to talk about before I go, anytime you talk about threading in Python, you have to talk about the global interpreter lock, also famously known as the GIL. What is the GIL? When Python executes in multiple threads, it has to acquire a lock called the global interpreter lock before Python can be run. So the upshot of that is that no matter how many threads you have, only one of them at a time can be executing Python code. So let me say that again. Only one thread at a time, no matter how many threads you have, no matter how many processors you have, only one of them at a time can be executing Python code. Now you may ask me, what is the point of threading if only one thread at a time can run Python code? But there's a couple exceptions to that. So if your code is what we call I.O. bound, that is you're reading a large file off of disk, okay, and you're waiting for that file to be loaded off disk, and that's what's taking a long time. We call that I.O. bound. Or if you're downloading data from the internet and you're waiting for those packets to come in, also that's I.O. bound. If your code is I.O. bound, it will release the GIL while it's waiting on that I.O. operation to happen. Okay, so you can run other Python while you're waiting for that file to download or that file to be read off disk. Now, if, you're, if your code is CPU intensive, we call that CPU bound. But if your CPU bound code is running outside of Python, so for example, you have imported a library that was written in C and it's doing all its crunching in C or C++, like in the case of uh, Qt, in that case, that gil is released while that code is being executed outside of Python. The case where you really have to be careful of the gil and threading is when you have CPU-bound code that is written in Python. So if you've written some very intensive operations in pure Python, you're not calling out to C libraries or C++ libraries, then you can run into problems with the global interpreter lock. So it's just something to be aware of. You know, I, I don't have any prescriptions for you to avoid that, but if, if you're finding that your threaded code is not behaving properly, that, that may be a possible reason. So threading can be tricky, but hopefully, you know, you can download this code and take a look at it and see how I've done it. There are other good tutorials on the internet, and of course I do cover this in good detail in a large chapter of my book, so please do check that out. In the meantime, I hope this has been helpful and educational to you. Have a lot of fun coding, and until next time, God bless.